Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Dan Kahn. I uh, live in New York City and uh, run the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. I'd like to uh, especially thank Nori and the events team here for really uh, just an extraordinary job on putting together uh, this. Uh, I've, I've actually been coming to Japan with the Linux Foundation for almost a decade on and off, and it's just amazing to see the growth and the level of interest. Um, so I wanted to uh, dive in and tell you a little bit about CNCF and uh, how it matters and, and why it may affect you. And uh, CNCF is part of the Linux Foundation. We're just a little bit less than 18 months old. Uh, we have now have 10 projects in the Foundation, of which Kubernetes is the best known. It was the anchor tenant um, originally, but we've now added in a number of new ones, including uh, the Container Network Interface, CNI, which just came on uh, last week. And uh, I want to give a shout out to our Platinum members that provide the majority of the funding, uh, especially Fujitsu, which was a, a founding member of the, uh, of the Cloud Native Foundation, and, uh, and NEC, which has also been very supportive. And uh, as you've seen from the last few days here, the Linux Foundation is much more than Linux. Uh, so later today, there's a talk from Let's Encrypt, which is providing free certificates to uh, the world's websites and creating uh, more than 50% of the pages on the web are now HTTPS. Uh, our pitches spoke about ONAP. Uh, ONAP. I talked about, I'm talking about CNCF. Uh, Dan Couchy has uh, the whole parallel session is talking about automotive grade Linux. And then Brian yesterday uh, had a great conversation on blockchain. But these are actually, there's uh, several dozen more projects within the Linux Foundation, and this uh, URL brings you to them. Okay, and then I just want to give um, a very abbreviated version of the talk I gave yesterday about how Cloud Native fits in to the history of application development. If you go back to 2000 and uh, at that point, when you wanted to launch a new application, you needed to buy a physical server, or often a rack of servers. And uh, that was very expensive. It led to a high stock price for Sun. But then in 2001, VMware uh, came out with uh, the technology to allow virtual machines that you can put an application in a VM and have multiple applications on a box. Then in 2006, Amazon Web Services popularized the idea of infrastructure as a service to allow, uh, rather than having to spend capex on a uh, on your hardware, you, it could become an operating expense that you rented by the hour. And in 2009, Heroku popularized the idea of a platform as a service and the magic of being able to type git push Heroku to have the new version of your application deployed. And what's interesting is all four of those steps were proprietary companies. The next four on our little brief history here are all open source offerings. So in uh, 2010, you had OpenStack, which uh, took the technologies from VMware and Amazon Web Services, made those available in an open source platform. Then uh, Cloud Foundry, uh, that uh, Abby spoke about two days ago is an open source platform as a service similar to Heroku. And then in 2013, Docker came along and popularized the concept of containers that you can wrap your application in a container, making it much easier for that to move around. And then finally, the last stop in 2015 was the creation of CNCF, and uh, where we are started out hosting Kubernetes. And we define cloud native here as having three key parts, that you divide your application up into microservices, you package each part in its own container, and uh, you dynamically orchestrate those containers. And so let's just talk about why people are so excited about these changes. Uh, sorry, uh, this is a kind of a crazy chart where uh, it's 448 projects and companies in this space. I will point out that uh, this is on GitHub in a high resolution version. And if your company or project is missing here, uh, please open an issue and we'll add it in the next version. But what we're trying to do here is build a map of cloud native and say that there is a destination that we're all trying to get to, but there's actually multiple paths that take you to that destination. 
And then the projects that are in green here, so Kubernetes, Rocket Container D, CNI, CoreDNS, and others, are the ones that we're hosting at CNCF. We're not saying that these are the only way to be cloud native, but we are saying that we're working uh, and have uh, picked a very good group of technologies that we uh, are sure work well together and, and, and can meet uh, enterprises and startups' needs. Okay, so why are people making this journey? Uh, one of the biggest is to avoid vendor lock-in, that open source software um, enables deployment on any public, private, or hybrid cloud, and uh, you can download the software, you can use it yourself, and then there's multiple vendors that can support you, so you can switch from one to another if you want to. Uh, a really extraordinary level of scalability. Uh, Kubernetes is evolved from uh, Google's experiences with their container system Borg. That system uh, launches more than 2 billion containers per week. That's 3,300 per second on average, but of course, uh, at peak, it's much, much higher. And so the system is designed to support thousands of self-healing multi-tenant nodes. My uh, favorite example of this, uh, and the, what finally got my sons to take my job more seriously, was uh, that Pokemon Go runs on uh, Kubernetes. And I've, I've heard that it, it took up to 60,000 nodes at the, uh, at the peak demand. Um, cloud native is about increasing agility and maintainability. So the idea that you split up your application that uh, each of the parts are separately described uh, in, in uh, a way that your team can now scale much better. And uh, this is the concept of orchestration, that uh, you can improve efficiency and resource utilization uh, dynam by dynamically managing and scheduling these microservices. And that also allows you to uh, have a really extraordinary level of resiliency. So your individual container can fail, a machine, even an entire data center, and then as your demand goes up and down, you can adjust dynamically uh, to that. So uh, how does that impact uh, companies? This is a statistic from Puppet that uh, high-performing cloud-native uh, architectures tend to have 200 times more frequent development, more than 2,000 times shorter leads, a lower failure rate, and a much faster recovery from failures. So, uh, I think the takeaway from all this is to say that if you're building a new application from scratch, a greenfield application, that cloud native, it, the cloud native application architecture is the way to go. And in particular, I would say that the leading choice for cloud native orchestration is Kubernetes. It's been selected by a large number of companies. It's backed by this extraordinary group of members, including many here. And it's one of the highest uh, velocity development projects in the history of open source. So we should be done. But now I'm going to uh, just read one of my favorite quotes from John Maynard Keynes, that in the long run, we are all dead. Economists set themselves too easy, too useless a task if in tempestuous seasons they can only tell us that when the storm is long past, the ocean is flat again. And I just love that phrase, too easy, too useless a task. Because I want to make the argument that there actually aren't that many greenfield applications out there. That the real world consists of brownfield applications. And if you look at the gross world project product, that's all the GDPs from all the countries added together, it's $100 trillion. Essentially, all of that flows through brownfield applications. And we use this term monolith to talk about a big, consolidated, often like a large Java or um, other kind of legacy application that's very hard to evolve. So uh, I'll just quick question for the audience. How many folks have seen the movie 2001? Yeah, see, with the younger crowd, I, I, I need to do more like a Star Wars reference or something. But it popularized this uh, concept of a monolith uh, that's uh, this big, imposing shape. Um, and the idea is that nearly all production applications in use today are monoliths. And so they're, uh, they're really the, uh, the opposite of cloud native. And that brings the question, well, let's just rewrite it. There's this famous book uh, 50 years ago, The Mythical Man Month, that shows that that almost never works. It created the term, uh, the second system syndrome. And it says that uh, many rewrites end in failure 
because the first system is evolving even as you're trying to replace it. And sometimes that first system evolves faster and you can never catch up. Okay, so monoliths are the antithesis of cloud native. They're inflexible, they're tightly coupled, they're brittle. So how can we evolve it? And step one is if you're in a hole, you want to stop digging. And so the idea is to try and stop adding significant new functionality to your existing monolith. And then there's this concept of lift and shift. And the idea is that whatever your legacy application is, you actually can containerize it. People think of containers as these very small, agile kinds of things, but you can take a, a Java application that requires eight gigabytes of RAM, and you can wrap a container around it, or another uh, fascinating example is Ticketmaster, where they are, uh, have code that still runs on a PDP-11, and they were able to get a PDP-11 emulator running inside of a Docker container in order to be able to containerize that uh, legacy application. Uh, with Kubernetes, there's a specific technology, stateful sets, what were formerly known as pet sets, that allow you to lock a container to one piece of hardware in order to make sure that it has adequate performance. Um, okay, and now, and this is really the key thought of the talk, you start shipping away at the monolith. And so uh, Ticketmaster, as I mentioned, has this challenge where essentially every time they put tickets on for sale, they're launching a distributed denial of service attack against themselves because so many people are coming in. And so uh, what they needed to do was have a set of front-end servers that could scale up and handle that demand. Rather than trying to write that in their legacy application, they put that new technology in a, uh, in a new piece. Now, sometimes chipping isn't enough. You actually need a chainsaw to cut away some of the original functionality or uh, new pieces that you're going to write. For example, if you want to have OAuth functionality, maybe that's a Node.js application that you put in front of it. If you have a particularly performance-sensitive task, maybe you write that in Go. And you're still having uh, API calls back to your existing legacy monolith, but the new functionality can be written in more modern languages by different teams that can work with their own set of libraries and dependencies, and it starts splitting up all of that, that, that monolith. Uh, KeyBank in North Carolina had very good success putting Node.js application servers in front of their legacy Java application in order to be able to handle mobile clients. Now, uh, a key thought is that the highest value today from cloud native is with stateless services. So uh, application front-end servers where you need resiliency, load balancing, uh, auto-scaling. An interesting example here is Wikipedia, where uh, they are taking their MediaWiki PHP application servers and putting those into Kubernetes, but their data store, which is a massive MySQL database, is remaining on a bare metal server uh, because they don't have a good enough story today to justify moving into uh, to cloud native. And uh, the idea is that when you are eventually ready to transition your data stores, uh, it's still challenging today to use legacy systems like Postgres or Redis. There are some interesting cloud native database solutions uh, like CockroachDB and uh, Vitess, which came out of YouTube. Uh, there's also uh, if you're in the public cloud, a number of hosted data services like Amazon RDS and, and uh, Google Spanner and others. And, but the idea is that this really should be the last thing that you're transitioning to a, a cloud native architecture. And uh, then I would make the argument that you should consider uh, a constellation of complementary projects such as the ones within uh, CNCF. And so when you're uh, in a cloud native environment, some of the uh, biggest priorities are monitoring, tracing, and logging. Uh, Prometheus for monitoring, open tracing, and uh, FluentD, which was developed here in uh, Japan. A majority of the developers are Japanese, and we uh, had the FluentD talks yesterday. Uh, then I'll just mention a few others. Linkerd is a service mesh to support more complicated versions of routing. 
gRPC is an extremely high performance uh, API system that can replace JSON REST. Uh, Core DNS is a service discovery uh, platform. Container D and Rocket are uh, both container runtimes that were recently added. Container D is the upstream runtime that's used in Docker. And then finally, uh, the Container Network Interface, CNI, is an uh, architecture for network plugins to support more complicated architectures. And so eventually, uh, when you've chipped away enough, you can evolve your monolith into a, a beautiful microservice. Now, uh, Grover Norquist in uh, the United States, who's always trying to lower taxes, has a phrase that he wants to get government small enough that he can drown it in a bathtub. Uh, maybe your goal is to eventually kill off your monolith. More realistically, it's going to stay around forever, but uh, hopefully you can evolve pieces of it off and even have a beautiful collection of uh, different microservices that are all connecting together and being uh, orchestrated in a single system. And so uh, when you think of Kubernetes and uh, the kinds of architectures that it can work with, I really want to emphasize this concept. Uh, there's a term, the soft bigotry of low expectations, that you shouldn't just think, oh, I need to do a greenfield rewrite in order to get the benefits of cloud native. Uh, the big message here for, is that Kubernetes loves brownfield applications and that there is an evolution path that almost every enterprise and, uh, and company out there should be on. So um, uh, if you download this presentation later or take a picture of this, these are some detailed articles on um, a few of the uh, companies that I mentioned and there's a lot more case studies on Kubernetes.io that actually talk about uh, these similar themes. And um, finally, I wanted to uh, invite everyone to the big event that we're going to be having in Austin. This is actually going to be one of the largest events that the Linux Foundation has